Welcome to another of the SANS Instant Commander series. I'm your host, Steve Armstrong Godwin. This is the first of a two-part series. We're going to look at, in this one, planning for supply chain compromises. And the next one, we're going to look at dealing with supply chain compromises. So let's get started. So the first one, and this is a bit of a summary slide. Firstly, what we're going to look to do is understand actually who our suppliers are. Suppliers, they're external third parties, call you and what you want. Um, how do I understand who they are? Procurement because most of these things should be through contracts. So procurement or finance can help. Certainly they will tell you who you're spending the most with, which in theory should be the most important people to you. However, it's the business units really who will actually explain to you who actually they rely upon to deliver their services. So speak to both procurement finance and business units to see what that breakdown and how those lists of the most important people to them match up. Once you've done that, then think about categorizing what those people do to you. Think about if they're supplying people, um, who they are, are they HR, are they press, are they finance people, are they sysadmins, are they web application admins, firewall administrators, what do these people do? So think about what they do, or if they're doing data processing, are they processing your data on your network, or are they processing your data on their network? Depends whether you exfiltrate or upload it to their sites. Um, or whether they actually, you know, they, they, they have remote access to it on your site or whether they provide you with a product. A firewall, for example, processes your network data, but it's also something that sits on your boundary. So a vulnerability in a firewall could mean you have a problem on your network because now one of your third parties or your suppliers has let you down. So understanding that's kind of good. So the data processing. Also, if they are people or if it is a service, um, is a service performed remotely or is it performed locally? If it's remotely, do those people have remote access into your network? Because that could uh, raise them up the risk scale because they have remote access in. So we're going to look at those in depth. We're also going to cover a little bit about how your press and CTI can help you and how you can exercise. Think about exercising your team to deal with third parties. So understanding your supply chain. It's amazing how many suppliers a large organization has. Heck, I mean, I used to have a, a 15 people company and I was surprised that I had like 45 um, different suppliers, just of core components and core functions and services. When I looked at my wider, uh, you know, everybody who ever supplied me anything, certainly talking to finance, it was over 150. That was for a small business. You take a 25, 30,000 uh, people company, it's gonna be a vast list, okay? So understand who they are, how many have you got, what kind of functions they do. And then think about actually, let's look at our IR plans. Have we got anything in our IR plan for third parties? No. Have you got anything in your IM plan for third parties? No, then you need to think. You need to write a plan. So the kind of proactive stuff I said before, Okay, so things like um, understanding your critical services. Remember in the, in the previous one when we were talking about sort of the how long does it take you to get your timeline you know, worked out and how long does it take you to recover from a major you know, com a compromise? Understand what your MOC is, your minimum operating capability. Okay, and also understanding the uh, how are there the HW, um, uh, HDWMM, how do we make money? Um, understanding those two things should allow you to understand what your critical services are, which I asked you to work out on the last video, but also then work out what suppliers are critical to the delivery of those services, okay? And identify those as being key suppliers. Then maybe reach out to them and say, hey, you know, if, you know, if there's a major impact to you, what's the, uh, you know, what's your disaster recovery plan? And how, and how much can you support us if you have a major impact? Now, the relationship dynamic here is really important. For example, it, you may turn around and say, you know, we're spending, you know, $50,000 a month with Amazon. We must be, you know, a key, uh, a key uh, customer of theirs. No, no. Government departments are spending way more than that per month. So you're not a major person to them. They may be to you. So it's important to understand what is the most important dynamic there. You may be employing a specialist company, has like five people in the company, and those are the, the best five people in the world, possibly, at doing that particular function, okay? And because you engage this five-person company and you use all five people of them and using them, you know, three weeks of a month, you are very important to their business survivability. Okay, your business survivability may also actually be linked to them purely because they do such a specialist job and the, you know, the software or the program or the hardware or, or some part of your manufacturing process. It says that if this breaks or doesn't work, you must go to one of these five people, otherwise you'll not be able to get yourself working. You know, so that can be a good, good understanding that dynamic. 
And if you turn around and find out that you do have only one or two key suppliers of those services that support your critical capabilities for your MOC, you might want to consider diversifying. Because being that, the fact that you have unicorn suppliers effectively puts you at a high risk of them going out of business or getting hit by a bus or getting hit by ransomware and their impact is suddenly massive for you as well. So I talked about uh, remote access, etc. And here I kind of break them down really crudely into four four distinct areas. Up top here, I mean, if I got my where's my little pen? Can I get a little pen up here? A little pen. There we go. A little pen here. So up top here, um, no, I don't actually have a pen. What do I do? Yeah, pen, 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 pen. There we go. Pen. Um, up the top here, have if they have remote access and are critical to you. So if they've got remote access into your network and they support a critical service, those are your like number one priority uh, kind of organizations. Now, if they are critical to you but have no remote access, it's not as important. It's really good to understand what they are, but the fact that they don't come on your network and they don't have that remote access means a compromise of them does not necessarily mean that you have been compromised. Availability of their services may be impacted, but certainly your direct network connection is not there. So therefore, you know, the attacker didn't leverage their network to get to your network. This is possibly the most dangerous group, I think, here. And this group is the, uh, this one here. This, uh, they are not critical, but do have remote um, access. I put this as dangerous, not because the organization is dangerous. It's because if you, when you are originally onboarding the supplier, thought that what they did wasn't important to you, your level of diligence will be lower. You know, the attention to detail, the, the number of questionnaires that you send them, all of that process that you go through, that onboarding process for new suppliers. If it's not critical, it's much lower. And you think about that. If you're an organization that is doing, maybe has a large PCI environment, the people supporting your PCI, loads of controls around. The people supporting the, you know, the locks and, and, the, and the things to get in the building, much lower. However, if, the, if the, the ones who stop you getting in the building you know, or, or allow you in the building, if it's an alarm system and an access control system, and they are the ones, and they're deemed not important, but if they have remote access, then they are potentially more dangerous to your organization than all of the rest of them. Because if they are deemed as critical and they do have remote access, your level of diligence will be up here. If you think they're not critical, they'll be down here. And that gap is a major risk. And finally, if they're not critical to you and if they're not, um, they don't have remote access, I'm the, I, that's a, the bucket that everybody else goes into. Okay. But certainly knowing these top three is super important. Okay. So I said about linking in with other people, I would certainly say think about linking in with the likes of your press and your social media teams because, okay, a lot of times when suppliers get hit, they haven't got the capacity in the early stages to reach out to all of their customers and say, hey, we have an outage, etc. Sometimes they do, but I'm not relying upon it. And the best way to allow myself and my organization to monitor our suppliers is to engage with things like press and social media teams. These people usually have tools to monitor social media. And all I can do is give them a list of maybe you know, 30 or 40, say these companies are critical to our ongoing uh, availability of operations. Therefore, I want you to monitor any bad chatter about them, uh, anything that links you know, this company name and hacked, compromised, exploited, that kind of stuff. And then give me a daily automated report on that, that I can get my IR team or my SOC team to have a look at just to check to see are any of our suppliers listed. You know, because if you get, for example, um, if you have a supplier who's got remote access, supports a critical service for you, and they get impacted with ransomware, they may not have the ability, the wherewithal to actually communicate to you that they have a problem. But your social media monitoring teams or your press monitoring teams who are looking at their sentiment around your business, you also train them on your suppliers. They may turn around to you and say, this supplier hit the press late last night because they've been ransomware and the attacker is claiming that they want $5 million uh, um, to stop them leaking the data, which potentially could be our data. That's really important and really good alerts that you can get. Now, don't expect them to be SOC level monitoring. It's going to be like office hours, etc. But if you can get a feed, if you can put some configuration things in there to actually have their software, whatever tools they have, automatically triggering on those, sending even a daily update email into your SOC, brilliant monitoring. 
So once you've done that, um, also then leverage uh, cyber threat intelligence, sort of turn and say, okay, let's let's again monitor um, our list of critical and extended list of suppliers. Start on the critical. Once you got that sorted, then extend out, adding more and more suppliers. But also review those critical suppliers and say, who are the threat actors who want into those who also want into us? Okay, to see is a particular threat actor say, hey, I always hit pharmaceuticals as well as always hitting defense companies. And you go, okay, so if I have a, if I have a pharmaceutical who's supporting me as a defense company, okay, for whatever reason, bear with me. Um, the attacker, the same attacker who's using, usually hitting those two um, industry verticals could simply use one to get access to the other one. So it's good to compare your threat map against those of your suppliers to see what the overlap is, because that might be an increased likelihood of the, that attacker hitting you both for to hit them to get access to you. Okay, this is more of an intro for what we're gonna talk about next time. Um, next time we're gonna actually go through this. Um, when I was first putting together the LDR 553, I realized there actually there's no real dedicated, focused incident management plan around third parties or supply chain incidents. So I came up with one. So in the next one, I'm going to go through all of these various stages. You can see here the confirm, identify, research, assess, investigate, consider, and communicate. I'm going to go through those in depth. I'm going to explain the thinking behind each one of them. So your homework for next time is to go to the ldr553.com slash third party, which will redirect you to the SANS cheat sheet. We put this little place here, SANS cheat sheet, where you can download this whole form, where we put it as a nice little sort of document you can either print out or stick up in your cubicle, etc. Okay, so homework for next week, download that ready to go. Okay, there we go. That was it. Quite simple. If you like this, as I mentioned before, we're doing this quite a lot on LDR 553, where we look at, we have a whole day focusing on things like third-party supply chain. We have, a, we have four beautiful exercises as we take you through an entire scenario, looking at the notification, the investigation, the drafting of uh, questions and follow-up stuff to the quizzing of the, of the third party, to dealing with the output and dealing with the impact as to what they're doing and having those discussions about whether we should continue the relationship with the supplier. A lot of really good fun stuff. Say four ba lovely back-to-back -back exercises that we do just focusing on supply chain and type incidents. Usual stuff, contact details, and as ever, as I always say, see you on the next one.